morning. Welcome to Journey. Welcome to worship. January ran away and left us. Goodness. Yes, it's almost February. And in my business, that means it's way too close to Easter. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So we can look back at one month, but we can look forward at the, le the next 11 months. When we do, we'll see that next Sunday is the first, first Sunday of February, and the first Sunday is, is the time that we, I'm not going to stand behind all that stuff, the time that we gather as a whole church family with our Samoan community and anybody else we can drag in and share the Lord's Supper together. This time, we will take just a moment to, to affirm and, and consecrate the new leadership team that we elected at our church conference last week. Um, it doesn't take long, it's painless, so if you're part of that group, you will be here. Today, we are going to share the last in our series about the Good Neighbor Experiment. We've been looking at the, what the experiment calls in one place, the ingredients of neighboring soup, which are relationships just 
knowing folks, knowing their names and knowing more about them and they about us, relationships, abundance. As we get to know one another, we discover that you ought to have these people in your choir and their, their contribution to the choir is that they're not going to sing. We discover the folks who can do the things we knew we never could and, and are just amazed at, at their gifts. And then we start thinking about how all those gifts work together to make the whole community and the whole neighborhood a better place for everyone. And that generates joy. Joy is our subject this morning. And I confess that I had a lot more time getting started about joy, that, or a lot more, more of a struggle than I thought I would. And the webinar that we shared yesterday, our, our Good Neighbor Experiment leaders shared, gave us some answers about joy. And we'll invite, we'll invite it, be sharing some of those a little bit later. And as we move through February, we'll be inviting all of you to, to learn more and begin to participate in the Good Neighbor Experiment. Not completely related, but related to the song we just heard. Martin Luther, you remember Martin Luther. 16th century Catholic priest who triggered the Reformation and the whole other Protestant branch of the church tree. Someone asked Martin Luther what the definition of worship was, and he said it was the 10th leper turning back. And that's, that's the story we'll hear and, and think about together a little bit later, the story of 10 lepers who came up to Jesus as he was passing through the village and, and begged him for mercy. And he said, go show yourselves to the priests because when you had any kind of a skin disease, you had to show yourself to the priest because you'd been isolated and they had to certify your cure before you could come back into the life of the community. And as you, as you may remember the story, nine of those lepers, when they went, they looked down and discovered that they were clean. And nine of them just went right on as fast as they could go to the, to the priests. And one of them slammed on the brakes and turned around and went back to Jesus to thank him for his healing. So we'll talk more about that a little later in the service. Right now, with thanks for the first month of the year and holy expectation for the months to come, let us stand and worship God. Come, let's sing out loud to the Lord. Let's bring the joyful to God who is the rock of our salvation. Let's take just a moment and spell over because you can see we have exclamation Ten points. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking about our joy. Come, let's sing out loud to the Lord. Let's joy the rock of our salvation. Let's come before God with thanks. Come, let's worship and bow down.
joy we have gathered to celebrate your love you meet us when we feel lost you find us when we have no home you join in borderlands to heal untouchables and include outsiders you delight in wholeness you never give up on your creation today we come to say thank you come and celebrate with us Send your spirit to celebrate with us and connect with the community in our church and our neighborhoods. Lead us to enjoy your presence in every place and circumstance. Through Jesus Christ, the Lord of life, amen. The Bible reading is, whoops, Bible reading is taken from Psalm 98. Sing to God a brand new song. He's made a world of wonders. He rolled up his sleeve. He set things right. God made history with salvation. He showed the world that he, what he could do. He remembered to love us, a bonus to his dear family, Israel, indefatigable love. The whole earth comes to attention. Look, God's work of salvation. Shout your praises to God, everybody. Let loose and sing. Strike up the band. Round up an orchestra to play for God. Add on a hundred voice choir. Feature trumpets and big trombones. Fill the air with praises to King God. Let the sea and its fish give a round of applause with everything living on earth joining in. Let ocean breakers call out encore and mountains harmonize the finale. A tribute to God when he comes, when he comes to set the earth right. He'll strengthen out the whole world. He'll put the world right and everyone in it. Okay, I'm going to talk about my very nice neighbor. Her name is Joyce. When I moved to my new condo almost a year ago, nobody told me where to park. And so I just pulled in and parked in front of my place. Well, that wasn't right. I had people coming to my door at all hours of the night. 
And I mean, one guy came at two in the morning and rapped on my door and said, you're in my parking spot. And I was like, well, I'm sorry, I don't know where to park. And I wasn't even mad because, you know, I was kind of wondering where to park myself. I mean, so I called the HOA and they said, can't tell you because, oops, we lost me. Oh, okay. I can't tell you because your name isn't on the, uh, the uh, contract yet. The other lady's name is on it and I'm not allowed to give you that information. And I'm like, okay. So um, after a week, she finally came out of her house. Well, I shouldn't say finally, but anyways. Um, she came out and she said, Nancy, my friend used to live there. And she said, I'll tell you where she parked, so that's probably where you park. And I was like, thank you, you know? I was so grateful for this woman. You know, everyone else didn't, you know, didn't do that. Well, anyways, um, since then, we've been good neighbors. Uh, we watch out for each other. She lives alone, I live alone. She uh, got a pit bull dog as a puppy and uh, she, it's a, it's a big dog now, and uh, she, it takes her for walks, not she takes it. So uh, anyways, um, when she first got it, he came over to my door because I have two cats and he wanted to check them out. And every time that he barks and she's in the house or something, I, I say, his name is Patches, and I say, hey Patches, what's the matter, you know? And, he just responds, he's, he's a cool dog, and she's a really cool neighbor. Now, um, at Christmas time, we have this little slot underneath our, our security door where we can like shove mail or, or something. And I, um, I gave her a Christmas card. And she said to me, you're a, the only one that gave me a Christmas card. And I was like, wow, you know? And she has kids and grandkids, and you know, I have a kid, but not grandkids. Anyways, um, so uh, Lana and I play Scrabble at the Senior Center every Tuesday night, and we weren't g going to have it uh, during the, the holiday season for about two weeks. So we had it at my house, and I invited her over. <clears throat> she said, well, I don't play Scrabble, but I'll come, because she had given me for Christmas a bottle of that non-alcoholic apple, apple cider or whatever. And I said, come on over. We're going to drink that. And we just had a real nice time, and she joined in the game, and it was very, very nice. And uh, now she has a copy of the, the events at the Senior Center, and she joined a walking group. And anyways, um, we do watch out for each other, which is very important to me and to her. And so I thank you for uh, letting me share about my neighbor, Joy, or Joyce. The next Bible reading is taken from Luke 17, 11 through 19. It happened that as Jesus made his way toward Jerusalem, he crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men, all lepers, met him. They kept their distance but raised their voices, calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Taking a good look at them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. They went and, while still on their way, became clean. One of them, when he realized that he, had, he was healed, turned around came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet, so grateful he couldn't thank him enough, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus said, were you ten healed? Where are the nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God except this outsider? Then he said to him, get up, on your way. Your faith has healed and served you. Amen. Thank you for God's word. I just want you to know that if you volunteer to serve as a liturgist, you won't necessarily be on the clock uninterrupted the way Nancy was this morning. Thank you, Nancy. We're going to bring your neighboring talk back sometime 
when we're into that a little more because she had, there are so many little, little pieces in that that are just uh, kind of textbook pieces of, of what we'll learn as we learn about neighboring in the next few months. If I'd thought of this a little earlier, I would have had a fun story to go right here. But I didn't think of it really solidly till a little bit late. The best way to find the right answers is to ask the right questions. This week, I spent a lot of time asking the wrong questions about this story. See, I've used it a lot in the last half century or so. And I knew what it's supposed to say. And I've used it as perhaps you've has it used, you've had it used on you to generate some some guilt trips about if you could just be a little more thankful like the Samaritan, the outsider. But today, those are the wrong questions for this story. And finally, last Thursday morning, on our walk, Rufus the Wonder Dog, who was much smaller than Nancy's friend's pit bull, Rufus pointed that out to me. So I set those questions aside, those right ones. Rufus has taken ownership of the neighborhoods we walk, and he knows which people and animals belong and which ones don't. He has a few that he barks hello to regularly. The question he helped me with is, what does this story tell us about our neighborhoods? Some of us live in very homogeneous cookie-cutter neighborhoods. The houses came all, all came out of the factory at the same time. They all look about alike. The residents and their lifestyles are pretty similar. Some of us live in more diverse neighborhoods. There's a broader range of social, economic, cultural diversity. If they're much older neighborhoods, the houses probably look a little less similar just because the owners have had more chances to, to change them and, and make them suit their own needs. And some of us have a sense of living in borderlands. Our neighborhood is in transition. Maybe we've been there for all that, maybe we're part of the transition. And what we, the, the only thing we know about it is that it's not what it was, and it's probably not yet what it's going to be. Our story this morning has Jesus walking through a borderland between Samaria and Galilee. It was a very convenient shortcut for folks to get from the northern part of Palestine down to the southern part where Jerusalem is. And this borderland was neither Samaria nor Galilee. It was just kind of mixed. If you've been to the Holy Land, you may have experienced that tension in the borderland between the Israel part and the Jordan or Palestine or mostly Muslim parts. It's the same tension you find along parts of us, our southern border with Mexico. And the interesting thing about those areas is that sometimes those ethnic differences matter hugely and sometimes they matter much less than we'd expect. So Jesus is, is on his way from point A to point B, and he's going along and preaching and healing, but he really wants to get there. And as he approaches this village, 
10 men approaching. They're all lepers. Now, biblical lepers largely didn't have the disease that a doctor would, would diagnose today as leprosy. Leprosy was kind of an umbrella term for a whole bunch of skin diseases. If you took 20 people with, with leprosy, 20 of those people with leprosy to a modern dermatologist, he might have 40 or 50 names for their 20 diseases. But those folks didn't have dermatologists. They didn't have drugstores full of all the good things that, that you can put on that, that skin place and have it miraculously healed. Those folks did know that some of those diseases were contagious. If you were around someone who had that disease, you'd have it too very soon. And they didn't understand infections, but they knew that those, some of those diseases untreated spread and people died from them. So they isolated lepers. They didn't understand all the science, but they understood that it was, they were, it was not a good thing to have all those people in the general community. They forced the lepers to live outside of town, away from their families and friends, until they were cured or not. Well, the story says, they kept their distance but raised their voices. Jesus, Master, had mercy on us. If anybody asks you, yes, social distancing is in the Bible. These, these, these men had heard the buzz about Jesus, and now here he is. Go for it, guys. It's your best shot. So they raised their voices. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And he gave them what they want. Go show yourselves to the priest. You're well. The same authorities who had labeled them unclean were the ones who could certify their cure so that they could resume their lives. The Jews and Samaritans had lived together next door in that borderland for centuries, but they had disliked one another for centuries. And as a young Jewish boy, Jesus had learned that prejudice and managed to move beyond it. So he didn't care about Jew or Samaritan he did care about helping broken human beings become whole. He did care about getting to know our neighbors as full, rich persons created in the image of God. And he understood that getting to know one another involves looking beyond and beneath society's labels and stereotypes. And it means looking beyond and beneath our own biases and conditioning. This child of God over here is very different from me in some ways, and yet we share a clear family resemblance. We can look around on Sunday morning and see folks who are pretty different and pretty similar. So Jesus told the, told the lepers, go show yourselves, and they went and were made clean along the way. And when they saw they were clean, they picked up the pace straight to the temple to show the priests, all except for Sam. I was lazy this morning. I needed to, I needed to name that character. It was Sam. Sam, thank you for loaning us your name. <laughs> Sam started off down the road with the others, slammed on the brakes, turned around, and headed back to where Jesus had been. All along, every step of the way, Sam is shouting his thanks and praising God for the whole world to hear. He's really getting obnoxious. Sam found Jesus again, threw himself at Jesus' feet. His gratitude was 
bubbling over and bubbling over like it was never going to stop. Where are the nine? Jesus asked. Only the outsider, the one least likely, least expected, had come back to thank the one who had changed his life. Now, our language has gotten a little sloppy. We don't always distinguish well between joy and happiness. And they do overlap, and we often use the two interchangeably. But this incident helps us clarify that a little bit. The nine were so happy they couldn't wait to show themselves to the priests which they have to do to get back into society and resume their life. But they couldn't wait to get their cure certified, to resume their lives. They were doing what Jesus said. What do you expect? I will show myself to the priests, claim my cure, resume my life, And Sam had to do that too. He was just as excited as the others when he looked down and saw his clean, smooth skin. He knew he'd been given a huge gift. He'd been given his life back. The one who'd given him that gift was within reach. And the most important thing for Sam was not to go find the priest and claim what was his. The most important thing for Sam was to go find the giver of that unspeakable gift and thank him. Joy stopped Sam in his tracks, turned him around, propelled him back to the feet of Jesus. One writer says, joy is a permanent possession while happiness is fleeting. Joy stays, happiness comes and goes. Maybe Sam began celebrating his healing every year the way we celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. Maybe he started every day by remembering his gift of new life and the one who gave it to him. Maybe that foundational moment became a key to Sam's more joyful life. And that doesn't mean he was singing and celebrating 24-7. It does mean he lived more deeply with an awareness of the goodness and love at the heart of creation. Joy is a permanent possession. Wherever life leads us, we expect God to be at work in our neighborhood, on our job, in our family, in our plans and in life's wonderful surprises. In times when we when the future is all laid out for us and in times when we can barely see to take the next step, let alone the next mile. We expect God to be already at work in the best of times, the worst of times, and all the in-between times. And as we share life with neighbors, we don't preach, preach them a sermon every time we get together. We are who we are. We are joyful, glad children of a glad and generous God. Joy is a choice. We can choose to respond to our difficulties with bitterness, anger, resentment, or a passive aggressive whatever. Or we can offer the situation to God. When we do, don't ever offer that to God, offer your life to God unless you expect God to do something and are thoroughly braced. When we do, expect to discover God's presence in the midst of this all, along with our doubts and our struggles. Joy is a choice. We can choose to celebrate God's goodness with birthdays and other holidays, with growth markers and significant achievements as children and grandchildren grow, or 
as mom and dad and grandpa and grandma learn new things and go where we've never gone before. Joy reminds us of the giftedness of all of life. Well, yesterday, our <clears throat> Good Neighbor Experiment leaders were together in a three-hour webinar with some other folks in some other places who are going that route with us. They offered us, among other things, another, dimension, another definition of joy. Joy is when we are living most authentically, when we are most completely ourselves. Joy is when you and I are most fully the persons God created us to be, the person God calls us to be when and where we are right now. Sam's joy wasn't complete when he reached the priest and claimed his gift. First, he had to go back and thank the giver of the gift. If this story tells us anything about our neighborhoods, it may be don't believe the labels. Believe the person who's wearing the label. Jewish, Samaritan, Samoan, English, black, white, brown, yellow, Scots plaid. Jesus' Jewish audience knew that that leper who came back to Jesus had to be the good guy, one of the Jewish lepers. So it was, it was a stunning surprise when it turned out to be Sam. Sam, of all people. And Sam was just being himself. The joyful, excited, infinitely grateful self that God had created him to be. When are you living most authentically? When are you most fully the person God has created you to be? Take that home with you. Get it out in those quiet moments or the times when you hit mute to, to dull the commercials. Pay attention this week. What are you doing when you're living most authentically. Who else is involved? Did you have authentic, did you have opportunities to live authentically that you didn't follow, that you turned your back on? Did you take a step, try something new, venture out beyond your comfort zone? Did you share your experience, your joy? Sharing multiplies our joy. We relive the experience as we tell the story, and the folks we, we share it with feel the joy as well. If someone we're sharing our story with is at one of those stuck places, our joy story may be just the spirit nudge they need to get off dead center, to get moving and growing again. Sam didn't declare his story top secret and put it in the archives. He shared it. He invited others to celebrate with him. The joy spread through his neighborhood. If Jesus were here, you know what he'd say. Go and do likewise. Neighbor your neighbors get to know each other, discover the abundance God has given each of you for the blessing of all of you. Celebrate big joys and small joys. Tell your stories to each other. But never forget to come back to the beginning point, to the one from whom it all started. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Wondrous and generous God, your gifts are overwhelming. 
Your sun lights the way for our journey. Your stars light our darkness. Your living water quenches our thirst. Your broken bread opens the door to eternal life. Your healing touch binds up our wounds. Your forgiveness washes clean our sin. Wondrous and generous God, let praise erupt from the far corner, four corners of the earth. Let the ocean roar. Let the trees shout their joy. From the deepest depths of our being, our prayer searches the, for words of adoration. You are patient and kind, even as you wander far from you. We are, you are full of compassion and truth, even as we stumble in relationships and struggle to love those who are very different from us. Come now, wondrous and generous God, bring comfort to those who agonize over broken relationships, who mourn the death of what used to be. Touch those whose bodies need healing. Liberate those whose addiction take away from their full potential. Surprise those whose joy has ceased. Come now, wondrous and generous God. Make this church a place where seeds grow, joy is shared, songs are sung, peace is shaped, dreams are born, and ripples of love spread. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, as he taught us, we pray with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So, I have a way for us to live authentically, a next step, if you will, a way to experience some joy. Since this week coming is the first week of February, we have a wonderful opportunity each of the first week of the month to go to East Valley on Tuesday and um, help pack boxes of food and groceries that will then be distributed on Friday. They need our help on Tuesday and on Friday um, to do that. And um, I'm asking for, for you guys to join me in doing that and um, helping to both prepare the food to pass out on Friday. And I wanna just share a little vignette that kind of really goes along with the sermon. Um, one of the Fridays when I was there distributing the food, um, I met a gentleman who was getting uh, food from the, the program called Golden Groceries. And um, he said, I'm a super senior, um, and it is for senior citizens. And I said, oh, really? And he's like, are you a super senior? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm, I'm just barely a senior. And he said, oh, OK, well, if you're 60 to 70, then you're a senior. I'm like, OK, I'm a senior. Then he's like, well, if you're 70 to 80, then you're a good senior. But if you're 80 or more, then you're a super senior, and I'm 84. <laughs> and I, the joy was just bubbling out of this gentleman, and he blessed us. And it's really an opportunity to be authentic and to show joy and to feel the joy that comes from these um, people that are getting the groceries. And I just encourage you to join me. Thank you. Um, it's at 9 o'clock on Tuesday to build the boxes and nine o'clock on Friday to uh, distribute the boxes. Thank you. Any more information, you can see me. Thank you. That's the word that stopped that one man out of 10 and turned him back towards Jesus. Let thank you be the spirit in which we give our offerings today as we place them in the baskets on our way out. Let thank you be the spirit in which we live as we offer ourselves and our gifts to God each day until we're together again.
Thank you, faithful God, for every good gift of yours. Thank you for being a God we can always count on. You have blessed us richly out of your abundance and mercy. We give you this offering to express our thanks. We praise you. We worship you. We offer you our whole selves to serve you in Christ. Take our gifts and use them for your glory. Extend and multiply the reach and influence of these gifts beyond our wildest dreams. We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Hustle back to Jesus as quick as you can. Tell him, thank you for the peace, the joy, the love. And then, get out there. Get out there. Neighbor your neighbors in the name of Jesus, sharing peace, joy, and love. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.